Hello, everyone, and welcome to the September edition of Egypt Live Journal Club. I'm your host and moderator, Karen Talia, broadcasting live from Melbourne, Australia. Joining me from the Egypt Live team are my co-moderators, Drs. Deborah Smith and Rowan Lowry in Queensland. And we also have Dr. Natalie Bernay from Cleveland in the United States online with us, giving us some much needed tech support. We're having some tech issues today, so I'm um, going to be without a camera, but I'll be here um, throughout. So our topic for this month is mesenchymal uterine lesions, and we have two trainees and an early career pathologist presenting today. Um, firstly, to those in the audience who are not ISGIP members, we hope this session encourages you to join the society. Membership fees are discounted if you're practicing in a developing country, and membership is free for trainees. Next slide, please. So as you all know, Journal Club alternates between the USA and Australia month by month with Natalie Benet and I and our co-moderators alternating hosting these sessions. Next slide. I've now got two new co-moderators for our Australian sessions and I warmly welcome Drs Deb Smith and Rowan Lowry, both from the Marta Hospital in Queensland on board and thank them for their contribution. I've already noticed um, the load lighten with their assistance. Next slide, please. So here's the remaining schedule for 2022. Um, we've only got one more Australian session and we have actually just had a slot open up for our November topic, which is gynecological cytology. So if anyone in the audience is interested in presenting, please send me an email. And if you'd like to go on the list as a presenter for 2023, please also get in touch. Next slide. Just to remind you that in addition to journal club, trainees and junior pathologists can also participate in case-based presentations. And the interesting case presentation sessions are moderated by Drs. Jennifer Bennett in the US, alternating with Dr. Rabina Wadi in South Africa. Next slide, please. So the, this slide shows our learning objectives for Journal Club. Our primary aim is to engage junior and trainee pathologists in critically evaluating the literature and honing their presentation skills in a mentored and supported environment. We will provide you the journal article and we will offer feedback and mentor you as you develop and rehearse your presentation. Next slide. We also give you a PowerPoint template to help you put together your presentation. And this is a summary of the main steps that we follow when we're working through and appraising an article. Next slide. Uh, I'll just quickly bring you up to speed with some events on the calendar for the remainder of September from ISGIP Live. We've got interesting case presentation going to air on September 28th. And on the same day, a podcast will go live on the ISGIP SoundCloud page on the topic of grading mucinous ovarian carcinomas featuring Dr. Momini Borgeni. And also on September 24 is the first ISGIP pathology update in Spanish, moderated by Ricardo Lastra and Carlos Paraharan. Next slide. So to attend any of these events, you can register via the ISGIP educational website at isgip.ca. And remember, if you do miss the session, the recordings are made available for a few days afterwards and all Journal Club presentations are posted to YouTube. And finally, next slide, please. If you want to ask questions as we go along, use the Q&A function and we'll address these at the conclusion of the three talks. Please also use the chat function for general comments. Say hello. Tell us where in the world you are today. Um, and support our speakers. Next slide, please. So now to our uh, schedule for today. This month's theme is uterine mesenchymal tumours. Our speakers are Dr. Penny Lynn from New Zealand presenting a paper looking at lyomyoma-like uterine inflammatory myofibroblastic tumours. We've got Dr. Hansini Lawani from the US presenting a paper discussing atypical uterine polyps which show overlap with adenosarcoma. And Dr. Natalia Biagioni from Brazil is presenting a paper examining fumarate hydratase deficiency in stump lesions. Slide seven, sorry, next slide, please. So here are our three speakers for today. Um, Dr. Penny Lynn is a third year trainee in Auckland at Lab Plus at uh, Auckland City Hospital in New Zealand. Dr. Hansini Lawani is a breast and GYN pathology fellow at Washington University in St. Louis. And Dr. Natalia Biagioni de Lima is a surgical pathologist at the DASA Laboratory in Brazil. Okay, so let's get started. Penny, if you're ready to share your screen and unmute yourself, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Fantastic. Let me just share my screen. Uh, I hope everybody can see. Yep, that all looks great. Thanks, Penny. 
Fantastic. Uh, hi, I'm Penny and good afternoon from New Zealand. And I want to thank everybody uh, for the opportunity for me to present at this month's Journal Club. So the paper I'll be discussing today is titled Histopathologic and Molecular Characterization of Uterine Lyomyoma-like Inflammatory Myofibroblastic Tumor. Comparison to Molecular Subtypes of Uterine Lyomyoma. Uh, this paper is from the University of Helsinki and Helsinki University Hospital in Finland. It was published in the American Journal of Surgical Pathology in August 2022, and the authors had no conflicts of interest to disclose. A uh, little background on uterine lyomyomas and inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors. Uterine lyomyomas are common mesenchymal tumors derived from smooth muscle and they have a wide range of morphological patterns. Inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor is also a mesenchymal tumor and histologically the three main patterns include myxoid, vesicular or hyalinized. Uh, the molecular changes in lyomyomas include MED12 mutations, HGMGA1 and 2 overexpression, fumarate hydratase mutation and SIRCAT mutation. There are also other more uncommon alterations. And the most common chromosomal alteration is deletion at 7Q and other complex rearrangements. Uh, with IMTs, 90% are driven by a gene fusion involving anaplastic lymphoma kinase, also known as ALK. Uh, the tyrosine kinase domain is commonly fused with partners such as TIMP3, TNS1, or IGFBP53. And fusions involving other tyrosine kinase genes that are not ALK may also be seen, and these include RET, ROS1, and TREC3. And lastly, um, ALK fusions are not seen in lyomyomas. With regards to methodology, uh, the study prospectively analyzed 2,263 separate tumors from 728 patients undergoing hysterectomy. These tumors were originally diagnosed as uterine lyomyomas. And these samples then entered copy number analysis by single nucleotide polymorphism array and screened for driver events. Uh, 276 of these tumors and 162 normal myometrium entered RNA sequencing to determine the tumors with um, tyrosine kinase activation. And in total, nine tumors were identified and these tumors are referred to in this study as uterine lyomyoma-like inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors. And of these identified as lyomyoma-like IMTs, they study their tumor characteristics, morphology, immunohistochemistry, fusion genes, and activated molecular pathways. And pathway analysis used principal component analysis based on 500 differentially expressed genes. And of those findings, then went back and compared it to standard uterine myomas and normal myometrium to find any similarities and overlap. Uh, for GUTS results, this table shows the nine tumors identified with tyrosine kinase activation referred to as lyomyoma-like IMTs. Uh, six tumors shown here in the pink box had a fusion transcript with ALK tail and showed ALK overexpression. Uh, one had an inframed ALK transcription skipping axons two and three, and the bottom two tyrosine kinase transcripts had non-ALK fusion genes. And one patient with um, tyrosine kinase activation also had a germline ALK mutation shown here on the left. The clinical and um, tumor characteristics essentially did not differ between the two groups. The median age of diagnosis was 43 in IMTs compared to 45 in uterine lyomyomas. The most common symptoms were heavy menstrual bleeding and dysmenorrhea. Five were solitary um, and four occurred with at least one lyomyoma. Five of the eight tumors occurred in the submucosa and the rest were intramural. The median size was 4.5 centimeters and it ranged between two and a half to nine centimeters. And there were no reoccurrences of dissemination recorded um, during a follow-up range of 41 to 91 months. 
Uh, in terms of morphology, most of the identified IMTs were similar to myomyomas. They had similar macroscopic findings, such as a fern rolled cut surface. They were well circumscribed with no hemorrhage or necrosis. And here are the H and E sections from the nine lyomer like IMTs, and the last one of which is a frozen section. Uh, seven of the nine tumors had similar microscopic findings of a fascicular growth pattern. Six had at least a mild lymphocytic inflammatory infiltrate, uh, with two showing more than 20 lymphocytes per high powered field. Five were hypercellular, <clears throat> one was hypercellular, and all tumors had low mitotic counts and three with mild atypia. And there were no atypical mitosis, apoptosis, or necrosis. And this slide shows the outcome in a histochemistry result. Um, all the tumors without fusion and the one with the out transcript skipping axons two and three showed strong positivity. And the tumor with tyrosine kinase activation, but uh, without ALK did not show positivity and one tumor was unavailable for immunohistochemistry. And the study also performed a panel of other relevant immunohistochemical markers and the immunohistochemical stains were essentially the same between the two groups with ALK being the only difference. IHC showed that the IMTs to be positive for ER and PR, similar to uterine lyomyomas. They were also positive for smooth muscle markers um, all were positive for caldesmin except one, and all are positive for desmin. They were fumarate hydratase proficient and showed P53 wild type. The tumors were negative for CD10, B core, cyclin D1, uh, CD34, HMB45, CD117, and DOLF1. And these negatives are important as they rule out other mesenchymal tumors, such as um, endometrial stromosarcoma, perivascular epithelial tumor just and a matter of fibrosarcoma like tumor. Allelic imbalance in the nine tumors had a wide and variable range. Most of the nine tumors show different chromosome changes involving different chromosomes. Um, one patient had an germline ALK sense mutation and overall um, the findings were observational and non-contributory. Um, sorry about the busy slide here. Um, Study lastly characterized the differences between the nine lyomyoma like IMTs versus the previously described lyomyoma subtypes and normal myometrium on a gene expression level. So, in principal component analysis and unsupervised hierarchical clustering, lyomyoma like IMTs, which are these ones here shown in blue, um, showed a most similarity to so cap uterine lyomyomas, and that's the ones in the green and not the teal. And compared to normal myometrium in some subtypes of lyomyomas, there was activation of the vitamin C transport and dysregulation of, of ascorbate. Um, epithelial to mesenchymal transformation pathways were also enriched in IMTs. And JAXAT signaling is a pathway which can activate EMT was also enriched with overexpression of JAK3. And compared to normal myometrium, uh, multiple extracellular matrix pathways were enriched. And compared to common molecular subtypes of uterine lyomyomas where HOXA13 is upregulated, uh, it is here downregulated in all nine IMTs. And there was slight overexpression of HMGA1 and 2 and SAT-B2, which is normally upregulated in myoma subtypes, showed heterogeneous expression in IMTs. So this subtype of IMTs are a rare tumor that appear to masquerade as lyomyomas. And in this study, 0.4% of previously diagnosed lyomyomas were reclassified as lyomyoma-like IMTs due to the tyrosine kinase fusion gene. And a previous study uh, reported 0.3% reclassified based on outcome histochemistry and morphology. And although this is a relatively small number, IMTs have a reoccurrence rate of 25%, depending on the completeness of trend, uh, resection. And there's risk of extra uterine spread, therefore, and over a higher risk 
compared to benign myomyomas. And a variance, uh, variance in out-transcription was found in this study, and some of these have been linked to other tumors. One tumor had um, a transcript uh, previously reported in neuroblastoma, one had a um, fusion reported in vocal cord IMT, and other fusion partners have been reported in non-small cell lung cancer, IMT of the peritoneum and lung. The EMT and JAK-SAT pathways have also been linked to lung cancer. I think overall this suggests that the genetic pathways of IMTs have some overlap to other tumors, and it also demonstrates the heterogeneity of uterine IMTs. Uh, with regards to comparing to uterine myomyomas and normal myometrium, several pathways are activated, and there are, over, there are overlapping similarities of the ascorbic metabolism pathway and also the ECM pathway. And along with other similarities in morphology, immunohistochemistry, and clinical presentation, it raises the question on the classification of these tumors. Should these lyomyoma-like IMTs be classified as lyomyomas or inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors? So this study appears to be more of an observational study and likely a follow-up from a previous study in which the subset of IMTs were identified. And in terms of areas for improvement, although 2,263 individual lyomyomas were identified, and the resulting nine tumors which fit the criteria of lyomyoma-like IMTs may be too small for number for significant comparison. And especially as only one of the nine tumors had histopathologic criteria to predict adverse outcome, it being over seven centimeters in size. Um, and one where there's whether having a larger sample size would confirm the benign nature of these tumors. And also because only a small number of flyomer-like IMTs have been described, risk assessment during follow-up is limited. And this uh, the study only used hysterectomy specimens, which usually occur with clear margins and a low risk of reoccurrence. And should myomectomy specimens also be considered it may result in a higher reoccurrence rate. And the study mentioned that during the course um, of the study, four additional uterine IMTs were diagnosed. And the future studies comparing molecular characteristics between these lyophoma like IMTs to conventional uterine IMTs may give a better indication regarding the classification of these tumors. And it may also be worthwhile considering um, the molecular relationship between the subset to extra uterine IMTs. So um, final thoughts, uh, the study really highlighted the similarities between cellular lyomyomas and lyomyoma-like IMTs and includes the morphology, immunohistochemistry, and overlap of molecular pathways. And also it raises the question if it's practical to consider doing out immunohistochemistry on all uterine mesenchymal tumors. However, um, this will not pick up on the non-ALK tyrosine kinase pathways. And if so, what is the appropriate criteria to add ALK immunohistochemistry? And again, given the similarities, would these be better classified as lyomyomas or inflammatory myofibroblastic tumors? And the clinical uh, implications to consider are whether these tumors behave in an unfavorable way However, there's currently not enough information regarding the subtype. And if they do behave in an unfavorable way, um, the correct diagnosis is important as therapy using tyrosine kinase inhibitors may be beneficial in the subset of patients. So in conclusion, this study has made me more likely to consider IMTs as a differential diagnosis when coming across any unusual myomas. And I will be much, I'll be inclined to consider adding ALK immunohistochemistry. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Penny. That was fantastic. <clears throat> you did a really nice job with a tricky article that had lots of facets to it. Um, let's go ahead. We'll save questions to the end. I don't actually see anything in the Q&A at this point, so let's move on. Um, Hansini, when, when you're ready, if you'd like yeah. to share your screen. I'm Turn ready. Your microphone on. Yep. Share my screen. Yep. 
That looks great. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Ahead, yeah. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Hansini Leherwani. I'm a breast rewind pathology fellow at Washington University, St. Louis. I'm also available on Twitter. Please feel free to connect with me if you like my presentation. Um, the topic for today's journal club is atypical uterine polyps, which show morphologic and molecular overlap with malarian adenosarcoma, but follow a benign clinical course. This article was written by Dr. David Chappell et al., uh, and it was published in the Model Journal of Pathology in 2021. In this study, which was performed uh, by the institutional, it was approved by the IRB at Brigham's and Women's Hospital, a total of 63 cases were retrieved, out of which 58 were primary uterine polyps and 58 were residual and recurrent atypical uterine polyps from 58 women. And it was retrieved from the year 2005 to 2020. All the path reports were manually reviewed. The novel cases were identified using a combination of the terms polyp atypical, unusual, endometrial, endometrium, endocervical, endocervix, uterine, and uterus. The, to examine these hypotheses, they evaluated a total of atypical uterine polyps by NGS, FISH, and a combination of both. So um, uh, the, uh, uh, to include the hypothesis of atypical uterine polyps, they included incipient adenosarcomas, anything that has unusual morphologic variants of conventional uterine polyps, or a distinct molecular entity, and or a heterogeneous group com uh, comprising a combination of these. This was their hypothesis to classify as atypical uterine polyps. So what is a uterine polyp? A uterine polyp is something which is benign, monoclonal, and mesenchymal neoplasm. It has a fibrous stroma, Plus, it has non-neoplastic endometrial and endocervical glands. So to include atypical endometrial uh, uterine polyp, there was an inclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria included that a polyp needed to show at least one of the following features. And the three features were abnormal architecture, which included either early or focal pylodiform growth pattern. It had rigid or cystic glands and or intraluminal papillary projections. These were all included in the abnormal architecture. Second was abnormal periglandular stroma, which means that there is mild or focal periglandular stromal cuffing and or subtle subepithelial condensation. And we will look at those uh, images in the future slides. Then the third criteria was stromal atypia. Stromal atypia characterized by enlarged hyperchromatic nuclei with smudged chromatin. So um, the results were as follows. Look, about 81% of the polyps were located in the endometrium. 19% were located in the endocervix. Age was uh, 50 with the range of 23 to 75. About 50% of the women presented with atypical uterine bleeding, abnormal uterine bleeding. 36% had polyp on clinical examination or ultrasound. 14% was incidental uterine polyps. Then 72% um, were sampled with an endometrial biopsy or a curettage or a polypectomy. 26% were sampled using endocervical curettage or polypectomy. And then 5 and 10% were hysterectomy and spontaneously passed. On the follow-up of uterine sampling, about 18% were not performed. Then 48% were followed with repeat endometrial or endocervical curettage. 14% were again with hysterectomy. And then 5% and 19% um, were unknown. At the diagnosis of follow-up, about 44% had no lesion at all. 44% again, 44% no lesion, 44% banal polyp, and then 12% only were atypical uterine polyp. Then the clinical follow-up was uh, at a median range of 150 months, and the clinical outcome was that 79% were alive. That means there was no evidence of the disease, and 2% uh, died because of other uh, causes, and then 19% uh, they were lost to polyp. We don't know the clinical outcome. On the morphological side, the size of the polyp ranged from 0 0.5 to 5.8 centimeter. And as I said, that there was an inclusion criteria in the atypical uterine polyp. So that atypical morphological features included that 79% had abnormal architecture, which included the rigidly cystically dilated glands. 
76% had abnormal periglandular stroma and 17% had stromal atypia. About 76% also showed epithelial differentiation, which include tubal, either it was serous or mucinous or mixed. So out of the 58 women that were diagnosed with atypical uterine polyp, 11 of them, there was no clinical follow-up and they were all diagnostic cons concepts. 47 women were available for follow-up. Out of 47 women, 44 women had uterus, uh, intact uterus after diagnosis of atypical uterine polyp. And in three women, the atypical uterine polyp was diagnosed at hysterectomy. Out of 44 women, eight women underwent further tissue sampling. 28 women underwent follow-up curatage. Eight women underwent hysterectomy secondary to atypical uterine polyp. Out of all of these, 32 women underwent clinical follow-up without hysterectomy after diagnosis of atypical uterine polyp. Four additional women underwent hysterectomy after initial follow-up. And this was the uh, one which, was, which we saw in the previous table that there was no lesion in one banal polyp in two and atypical uterine polyp in one. And then 12 women underwent hysterectomy secondary to atypical uterine polyp diagnostics. And then again, there was no lesion in six, banal polyp in four and atypical uterine polyp in two. So this is the morphological criteria that that include. As you see that in A image, there is a focal phyllidiform growth pattern with some uh, periglandular stromal cuffing. And if you see the stroma, it's very edematous. Then in B also, you see this focal phyllidiform growth with very subtle uh, periglandular stromal cuffing. And here also you see in the C image that there is focal phyllidiform growth pattern. But if you look at the papillary projections, they are very blunt and they do not have significant periglandular stromal changes. And in D, if you see, there is some periglandular stromal cuffing with blunt intraglandular papillary projections, but it does not have an overtly phyllidiform architecture as you see in A, B, and C. So this is one of the examples of the morphological inclusion criteria. Then in the E image, you see that there is this very subtle subepithelial condensation. In the F image, you see this is a low power image and at low power also we see these rigidly dilated cystic glands with blunt surface papillary projections. But again, it is very subtly increased stromal cellularity. Here we see that there is uh, stromal cellularity is increased and this yellow arrow, I, I'm, uh, I apologize, it's very faintly visible, but that is the one that is pointing out to mitosis. And this was seen in most of the cases where they saw increased stromal cellularity with increased mitosis. And here is the image of the stromal cytological atypia and here we can see some smudge chromatin as well. This is another high power image of showing uh, subtle periglandular cell hypercellularity and you see these rigidly uh, cystically dilated glands. And then here again, there is this uh, scattered atypical nuclei with hypochromatic and smudged chromatin. So when they did the molecular profiling, they saw chromosomal 12Q13.5 1315 gain and amplification, it was seen in 27% of 22 polyps, which included one residual and recurrent atypical polyp. Then low level copy number gain was seen in um, nine primary and one residual recurrent polyps after three sequencing uh, units. And then seven polyps showed no copy number alterations Two of these, even though that they did not show any significant copy number alteration, two of these did show immunohistochemical HMGA2 overexpression, suggesting that this pathway can be activated by alternative mechanisms in a subset of atypical polyps, which apparently have silent copy number profiles. And they also performed IHC of HMG2A on and 28 polyps were positive and subsequent molecular pro, uh, profiling was performed on 22. NGS alone was performed on 17 polyps, FISH alone was performed on one polyp and both assays were performed in two polyps. So as you can see that this image 
Um, in the C image, we again see this uh, subtle subepithelial stromal condensation and that stain, when they stain with HMG2A, which is this stain, it was bright positive. And these were the genes uh, which were identified by NGS. So the importance of uh, telling you about HMGA2 and the gene profile is because uh, these are the same same uh, genes and uh, chromosomal alterations which are shared by uterine adenosarcoma. So uterine adenosarcoma is molecularly very heterogeneous and uh, recurrent copy number alterations are reported in uterine adenosarcoma. Amplification of chromosome 12, Q13, 15, which includes MDM2, CDK4, MG, uh, HMGA2, TERT, MIB-L1 and BCL2. These uh, MIB-L1 and BCL2 are seen in minority, but ma uh, maximum of the uh, uterine adenosarcoma have amplification of chromosome 12Q1315. And recurrent point mutations like B-core, ROS1, TP53, and ATRX were also, are also identified in uterine adenosarcoma. And as we know that whenever T53 and ATRX are associated, they are generally high-grade morphology and they have adverse outcome. So what is the differential diagnosis of a uterine polyp? Endometrial polyp with atypical bizarre stromal cells, where you do not see any stromal hypercellularity, periglandular cuffing, or even phylloids like architecture. And you just see some atypical cells, often with a loose collagenous background. So that is an atypical polyp with a, uh, endometrial polyp with atypical bizarre stromal cells, which comes under the differential diagnosis of an uh, atypical uterine polyp. Then second is adenosarcoma, which is uh, the main differentiation here. And in adenosarcoma, you see periglandular cuffing, you see glands with phylloids architecture, which we also saw in this uh, atypical uterine polyps in the morphological pictures above, cystically dilated glands. And uh, the endometrial is mostly proliferative type, which is the most common type of epithelium you see. And the diagnostic criteria is that you should see greater than two mitosis per 10 high power field with cuffing and or cytological atypia of stroma and then sarcomatous overgrowth greater than 25 percent of the tumor composed of only neoplastic stroma typically high grade so this is the definition of adenosarcoma so the discussion the discussion is that there is a very subtle distinction between atypical polyps from conventional benign endometrial polyps and it's very challenging on a morphologic uh, re-review when they did the review, nearly one quarter of uh, polyps were initially initially diagnosed as atypical uterine polyp ended up just being banal endometrial polyp. Then there is an entity called as adenofibroma. Even though this institution, uh, they do not use the term adenofibroma, but a lot of pathologists and institution do use it. And it's a very rare neoplasm comprising of benign glands and stroma, and it's no more in the WHO category or uh, WHO book as well. So uterine fibroma and adenosarcoma, they uh, without any sarcomatous overgrowth they have similar immunoprofiles and adenofibromas may rarely invade the myometrium or recur after, uh, recur after hysterectomy. Occasionally, uh, clinically aggressive, but uh, despite they have been having like benign behavior, they were clinically aggressive, but very occasionally also. And so therefore, this study provides a basis for molecular comparison to lesions which are diagnosed as adenofibroma, which could further elucidate that there is a relationship between these entities. So distinction between subtle low-grade adenosarcoma is also challenging. And even though there is a molecular overlap between atypical polyps and low-grade adenosarcoma suggests that these entities do exist on a continuum. Molecular testing should only be performed on a subset of atypical polyps, potentially limiting our detection of certain molecular findings. And uh, targeted NGS can be performed, but they might miss some pathologic alterations as well as balanced structural variants, which play a role in adenosarcoma sarcoma pathogenesis. The strengths and weakness of this paper is that only even though the review was performed from 2005 to 2020, only 63 polyps from 58 women were retrieved. 
telling us that this is a very rare and challenging entity. And diagnosis of atypical uterine polyp is not standard because of the variability in the nomenclature and diagnostic criteria. Thus, my final thoughts on the paper is that even though um, the atypical uterine polyps, they do show biologic overlap with uh, early Mullerian adenosarcoma, they lack the molecular alterations which are characteristic of a clinically aggressive adenosarcoma and they overall follow a benign clinical course. Therefore, a uh, conservative management with close clinical follow-up and repeat sampling can be considered for the patients when clinically appropriate. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hansini. That was fantastic, very comprehensive. Um, I was really pleased to see this paper and I have been pleased to uh, also see the prior paper from this group on uh, atypical urine polyps because I think these are actually quite common and really problematic lesions. So it's good to have a framework for how to approach them. Um, again, we don't have any questions in the Q&A, so let's press on and we'll move now to uh, Natalia. Um, when you're ready, Natalia, if you'd like to share your screen. Okay, are you listening to me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Excellent, that looks great. Thank you, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So my name is Natalia and I'm a surgical pathologist here in Brazil. And first I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. And I will talk about this paper called Fumarate Hydratase Deficiency Should Be Considered in the Differential Diagnosis of Uterine and Extrauterine Smooth Muscle Tumors of Uncertain Malignant Potential. Stop. Uterine smooth muscle tumors are morphologically char characterized on the base of cytologic atypia, mitotic count, and tumor cell necrosis into three distinct categories, benign as leomyoma, malignant as leomyosarcoma, and stump that don't fit into the benign or malignant category because they have or atypia or increased mitotic count or uh, indeterminate type necrosis. Fumarate hydratase efficient leomyomas are a distinct clinical pathologic class of uterine smooth muscle tumor. They occur in the context of hereditary leomyomatosis and renal cell carcinoma, HLRCC syndrome, that I will talk about on the next slide, and also in the sporadic setting. They frequently exhibit the typical histopathologic features, but they demonstrate benign clinical behavior. But because they have atypical features, they may be misclassified as a stump. In this paper, they cite two publications that first they, they made a diagnosis of stump, and then they reclassified as DFH leomyoma after doing the immunostochemistry. So HLRCC is an autosomal dominant syndrome caused by germline mutation in FH gene, which is a component of the Krebs cycle. So first occurs an inactivation of FH, then accumulation of fumarate and succinate that will react with cysteine with formation of 2,16-cysteine, 2SC, that increase proliferation and resistance to apoptosis. It's very common to have uterine and cutaneous smooth muscle tumors in this syndrome uh, that occur by the second or third decades, and about 15 to 25 percent of the patients, patients with this syndrome will develop renal tumors by the fourth decade that is very aggressive and is the main center for early detection. So we have the leomyoma first, and so we can screen for the renal tumor. About DFH leomyoma, sporadic FH alterations are more common, and, but morphologic features and mustochemical stains don't distinguish between somatic versus germline mutation, but we use this as the screen too. Here are some morphologic features of DFH leomyomas that should raise the suspicion for this entity. Here we can see the alveolar edema, hemangiopericytoma-like vessels in the other picture, and shivanoma-like appearance. Also, eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusions or hyaline globules are the same thing we can see here in both pictures and eosinophilic macronucleoli with perinucleolar halos. Other 
features that can occur too are hypercellularity, infiltrative margins, and increased mitotic activity. Nuclear atypia is very common, and it's commonly represented among leomyomas with bizarre nuclei. There is a study that found 17 of 31 leomyomas with bizarre nuclei to have FH deficiency. But it's important to know that it's, we should have the presence of many or all morphologic features to raise the suspicion for DFH leomyoma, not just one single uh, characteristic. Immunostochemical staining of this leomyoma show loss of the phage expression. We can see here in this picture with positive internal control. And 2SC is positive because there is an accumulation, like I said before, but I will talk about mustochemistry later. So the authors hypothesize that a subset of stump cases may represent the FH leomyoma. So they examine the prevalence and clinical pathologic features of these neoplasms in a large retrospective cohort of stump cases from their archives. They are from Stanford. And they select all cases diagnosed as a stump from 2007 to 2016. The court comprised of 48 tumors. They reviewed the age and E slide and immunostochemistry study and, all, and the pathology report too. The diagnosis of stump was made when there was indeterminate type necrosis, increased mitotic activity, or moderate to severe cytologic atypia. They also included tumors with epithelioid or myxoid morphology and stumps occurring at uterine and extrauterine sites. They documented clinical pathologic data and morphologic features. About its age mustochemistry, granular histoplasmic staining of the tumor cells was interpreted as intact, and absence of cytoplasmic staining was interpreted as deficient. Normal myometrial and intertumoral vessels served as positive internal control. Here we can see the intact expression of fumarate hydratase with positive internal control in the blood vessel in a smooth muscle tumor. They found the results. They found three tumors with FH deficiency in two patients. None of them presented epithelioid or myxoid features. The first case, the patient was young. She had 40 year old. The second case, the patient had 71. The first one, she had multiple tumors. Both made follow-up and both had no recurrence and no development of renal cell carcinoma. And both showed many morphologic features that we can see in this type of leomyoma. Here is the first case. Uh, we can see the HPC-like vessels in a smooth muscle tumor, and they made the FH that here is the loss of FH with positive internal control. The second case, there is eosinophilic cytoplasm with hyaline globules, and also the loss of FH by mustochemistry. There was a tumor that presented heterogeneous FH loss and patch internal control. So they, may, they interpret it as a equivocal result. We can see here there is loss of F, uh, fumarate hydratase, but we can barely see the uh, positive internal control. So it was better to interpret it as a equivocal result. The other tumors with intact FH expression the FH demorphological features were infrequent in these stumps. Only two tumors showed focal HPC-like vessels and one tumor were eosinophilic macronucleoli, but at least focal ATP was common among these non-DFH stumps. And interesting, all tumors with a predominant epithelioid or myxoid pattern exhibited intact expression of fumarate hydratase. Uh, so it's important to know this entity because it's commonly misclassified as stumps because both have atypical features. Their prevalence in this cohort is higher, 6.3% than the 0.4 to 1.6% in other studies. 
The aphasia glioblastomas often present with worsening clinical features suggestive of aggressive behavior, but they appear to have an indolent clinical course. In this study, there was no evidence of recurrence or disease progression over clinical follow-up of 59 and 96 months. And in the literature, the minority of patients developed recurrent leiomyomas. And among these patients, there was no evidence of disease progression. All patients were alive at less follow-up. Hemostochemical identification of fumarate hydratase loss helps us to classify as DFH leiomyomas, which supports a benign biological behavior and has not been reported in any of several large series of leiomyosarcomas. Just studies in Finnish population, they made an association between leiomyosarcoma and HLRCC syndrome, but the authors in this paper found it controversy because morphologic and clinical follow-up wasn't worked available so they favor DFH leiomyomas in these cases. And the detection of DFH leiomyomas allows for identifications of patients with HLRCC syndrome. The majority of patients present with symptomatic leiomyomas by the third decade, that is before the development of aggressive renal cell carcinoma. That's important. And prospective screening for DFH leomyomas may identify at risk women who would benefit from genetic counseling and renal cancer surveillance. In this paper, the authors said they screen almost all uterine leomyomas for morphologic features of DFH deficiency, but morphology alone has limitations because it can be heterogeneous and can differ between patients and within the same tumor. So, Immunostochemistry is useful, but has pitfalls. We need to be cautious because it's very good when there is a positive stain for 2SC and loss of FH. FH loss is very specific, but lack sensitivity. Some sense mutations in FH gene can retain FH expression. So even if the FH is intact by immunostochemistry, if there is the morphology, of DFH leiomyoma, we need to document, we need to suggest this diagnosis and suggest uh, the syndrome to look for the syndrome. And 2SC is very good, it's very sensitive and specific, but is not widely available and wasn't used in this study. And this may have resulted in missed cases. So, we have immunostochemical and morphologic limitations. So it's important to integrate pathologic and clinical features and do further investigation, mainly if the patient is young with symptomatic or recurrent leiomyomas and has a suspicious family history for HLRCC syndrome. Here is an algorithm that is from another paper, but I thought it was interesting in uterine smooth muscle tumor, we, they, uh, we have to exam for DFH morphology, the features that I said before. When it's absent, there is no increased risk for the syndrome, so we will classify according to the conventional criteria. But when it's present, there is an increased risk for the syndrome, so we have to document the presence of DFH morphology and the risk for the syndrome. Uh, we can he, uh, view here that they don't do immunostochemistry. They prefer to use the morphology because immunostochemistry has pitfalls, like I said. So uh, DFH leiomyomas should be considered in the differential diagnosis of stump because both have cytologic atypia. And when we made the diagnosis of DFH leiomyomas, we support a low biological potential and we will identify risk for HLRCC syndrome and do a germline testing. I think strength in the study, it was the first study to review the stump subgroup and characterize the FH leiomyoma. So it's good to know, uh, we need to know this entity and remember this when we're seeing stump. Uh, probably diagnose of stump. We need to remember this to not misdiagnose as stump or leiomyosarcoma. 
because we will support a low biological potential. And area of improvement, I think, is the immunostochemistry because 2SC, okay, it's very good, but it's not widely available. Here in Brazil, I think we don't have, as far as I know, we don't have just fumarate hydratase. Loss of FH is very specific, but lack sensitivity. So we may miss some cases when FH is intact, but we need to ha have in mind that we can't exclude this diagnosis when FH is intact. If there is the morphology, we need to document this. And applications is to identify women at increased risk for HLRCC syndrome, referral for FH germline testing, and do Reynolds cancer surveillance. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Natalia. If everyone would like to turn on their microphones and cameras. It looks like we have a single question in the Q&A. Uh, and this question is directed at Penny. Um, now, what morphology between lyomomas and lyomoma like IMTs was similar? Were there any specific morphologic features that were seen more commonly in the lyomoma like IMTs? i.e. Were, were there, was there more inflammation or mixoid change? Oh, hi, Daisy. Penny, you Thanks look like your screen's frozen. Can you hear us? Oh, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Penny. Yeah, yeah we can. Uh, <laughs> Great. Uh, thanks for your question. So, so yes, uh, the only thing specific that was found in these tumours were the lymphocytic infiltrate. So six of the nine tumours had some sort of inflammation. Actually, two of these um, had more than 20 lymphocytes per 10 high powered field. So I think the inflammation would probably be the only specific morphologic feature that differentiates between these tumors and standard lyo myomas. Uh, there were no mixed way changes in any of these. I hope that answers your question. I think when, when Penny and I discussed this article that we, I think Penny pointed out that yeah, of, of the nine, there are a good two or three with a good going lymphocytic infiltrate. And if you look at the design of this study, perhaps what's lacking is that no one went, uh, there's nowhere where it says, and then we, when these cases turned out, we went back to make sure the histological diagnosis is right in the first place. Because, mm -hmm. you know, everyone just assumed, I think that it's a lyomyoma going in, so it's a lyomyoma coming out. And you do wonder if maybe if a histopathologist had have looked at some of those sections once the molecular came back, if you might have mm -hmm. thought, oh, perhaps I should have done an elk on that. So I wonder if the true number of lyomyoma, real mimic-like IMTs in that group are actually a little bit lower than they stated. So they didn't do a direct comparison with their main group, uh, not a particularly meaningful comparison with their main group. So. I had the same hesitation when I was reading this paper and I was wondering why aren't they just IMTs with, you know, somewhat subtle morphology? And I guess it, it, it prompts the question, what do we do in practice if we've got some features, some subtle features that make us think of IMT and we do the stain and it's positive, does that mean we call it an IMT? I, where, where, where's the threshold? I think, that's, I think that's quite a hard question to answer because you have to... They, they will mean reclassifying these tumors from IMTs to biomyomas. But I, I think at this stage, you're possibly still classified as IMTs because we're not sure about what the clinical consequences of what it means, or do we change follow up and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and I think this is something else that, that came up during our discussion that. As, as Penny said, this, this group had it easy in a way. They're all hysterectomy specimens. So these women have, even if you come across an IMT, they're already treated. Um, there are, as Penny said, there's no myomectomy specimens. There's no curish hard specimens. So, and that's much more difficult when, you know, you might have a 37 year old woman who wants to retain her fertility and you've got something that looks very smooth muscly, but does have out positivity and where do you go from there? So I think that's a really difficult question. Yeah, I agree. Uh, is is doing an elk stain something that you've adopted in your practice when you see some 
subtle features that make you think about IMT or is this a, an entity that you weren't previously all that familiar with? Uh, this was an entity I wasn't too familiar with to begin with. I saw the title of the paper and I thought, oh, IMT is in Liomaro, it's interesting. But reading it, reading it through, <laughs> I think next time I come across a Liomaro with any slight inflammation, I'll probably have a very low threshold of adding elk. So. Yeah, I think, I think that we've all been through that. At some point, we've all woken up to the fact that these lesions exist and that some of them behave poorly and that we've, we've all realised that we've probably let some of these through in the past and just due to lack of um, appreciation of their existence. So, okay. so where does your threshold lie now, Karen? But when do you sort of think, I'll elk that? When I see inflammation, <laughs> um, and, and that somewhat loose, edematous-looking mm -hmm. uh, stroma, I don't think I've really seen... Well, firstly, I haven't seen an IMT in practice. I've probably thrown an elk at, uh, I don't know, five to ten smooth muscle tumours over the last three to four years, and nothing has ever come back positive. Um, so I've never seen one with true myxoid change. They've generally looked like lyomyomas with a bit of chronic inflammation, and that's what's prompted me to do it have you had yeah. one in practice oh sorry sorry, um, this is Natalie. sorry. yeah can you, can you yeah. Hear me? yeah i was just gonna say i i feel the same i like you using elk as a verb Ron, that cracks me up i like that um i will say that <laughs> i feel like the time when i get paranoid about it is these the smooth muscle lesions like usually lyomyomas with you know apoplectic or degenerative change however you want to say so they have a little bit of like edema slash myxoid change and I don't really know how to pin down whether it's truly myxoid right and then the inflammation kind of comes along with the repair so I would say I probably do out and maybe a couple of times a month and no I've never found one in practice uh, only in consult material which I feel like is enriched for weird stuff so that's not really fair you know yeah absolutely yeah. <laughs> sorry for interrupting I think you were thinking no it. no it's yeah. it's good um, so we don't have any more Q&A um, questions from the audience. Maybe we'll we'll move on to Hansini um, and your talk. Um, Deb, are you there? Did you have any um, particular discussion points that you would like to, to talk about with Hansini? I don't know that we've got... Sorry, I'm sort of here, but not... Uh, yeah, I am. I'm, I'm here, but not really. Hello. Um, I think... <laughs> Hi, thank you. Thanks, Tanzini. It's I think it's a difficult area because the um, the the distinguishing between the adenosarcoma and the atypical polyp relies on determining how much of those atypical features you've got, um, which is actually quite hard to find in the paper, and it's also quite hard to find the WHO um, guidelines. So, you know, I know you said about them being common, Karen, but I I mean I noted with Tanzini that they actually threw out a lot of their diagnosed atypical polyps from the paper um, as just banal. So I think that does make it quite difficult for those of us who are uh, in practice and don't see these a lot to work out where those thresholds are. Yeah, I agree completely. And when I say um, common in my experience, I think it's because I have a low threshold for fretting about endometrial polyps. I seem to see things... <laughs> You know, not that infrequently in polyps that get me a little worried and start me down that pathway. Um, it's a very rare thing, though, that I actually use the label atypical uterine polyp. Um, generally, um, we take these sorts of things to concordance and we, as a group, throw them away and say, no, it's not enough to even go there in terms of raising the possibility. Yeah. But I, I it would really have been interesting to have known which ones. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Say, it would have been interesting to have known which ones they threw out. Of their yep. um of their paper to know which ones didn't make it across the line, because then they also had one at uh, at the end that or at the beginning that was also the one that recurred that Hansini pulled out that um they also thought was borderline between atypical polyp and adenosarcoma. So when you look at this, you see this is quite this is quite a difficult sliding spectrum from one side to the other that we're supposed to pull apart and um, classify correctly. I completely agree. And some of those images for me, um, I mean, they were zoomed in uh, high power images, but they looked like adenosarcoma. 
Yeah. Um, so it is a really tricky area, but it's it's fantastic to have this um, label that we can attach and some guidance on what the next steps are if it's a curatage specimen in terms of resampling and the reassurance that there's now an accumulated 58 cases with benign follow-up. Uh, I'd agree with you, Karen. It's some of those some of those images were, I would, I would be very worried about adenosarcoma in those. And as Deb said, it'd be interesting to know what they were happy to just put out as a benign polyp. And I suppose, and this is maybe a question for Hansini, that we inherit diagnostic schemes. So we have adenosarcoma, high grade, low grade, and you have this terrible thing this terrible name of atypical endometrial polyp. Atypia is a word that gets so overworked in gynecological pathology. It's the kind of terminology where you don't, if you look at it, you don't even know if it's a specific diagnosis or not. Um, if you were going to recalibrate this entire scheme from scratch, I mean, would you even have this entity or do you have sort of like a polypoid lesion of uncertain malignant potential? I would have Ooh. just been so descriptive that endometrial polyp and see comment. And in the comment, I would have written, <laughs> that, <laughs> I would have written yeah. that it has this philodiform architecture and the cystically dilated glands because uh, all the polyps that they followed up were just benign. They have, yeah, I agree that when at first I look at it, it just looks like um, adenosarcoma. But then when they followed up, it's all benign. And they did share the same molecular alterations like uterine adenosarcoma as well. Um, but I, I, like, again, I have never used, I have never heard the term of atypical uterine polyp. And I don't think I'll ever call out also in my report ever. I'll just give a description. And of course, with a, a disclaimer that the patient needs to be followed up closely. Yeah, the only time I've ever used this diagnosis, I think, was also in consult material. And you you top line it, like you say, Rowan, with this sort of mishmash of almost nonsense, because it's not really conveying what you mean. But then I guess I try to explain myself in the comments, if that makes sense, but it's never quite satisfying. Yeah. Rowan, I think you just coined a new term, plump. Yeah. Polypoid <laughs> lesion of uncertain potential. <laughs> A new engineer. Oh. Yeah, oh. look out for my forthcoming paper. <laughs> I want to be middle author. <laughs> uh, oh, all right, the clinicians are going to love us. They're going to love. Us. Um and <laughs> and Natalia, your paper again, another um another entity we've probably all been looking at for years and years and not really recognizing or having a name for it. Um, is these FH deficient lyomyomas? Uh, has this paper um, initiated any any change in your practice, or will it will it cha change your approach to evaluating lyomyomas? Yes, I think we should look for the features that to have this diagnosis. We, we need to look for these features. We need to think, and I think. Maybe the immunostochemistry, I didn't know that when it was intact, it could be intact. I didn't know this. So even when, it, when it's intact, we need, if there is the morphology, we need to document this. We need to pr propose this diagnosis. So I think the immunostochemistry for me, it was something that I will add to my pra practice to know this, that when it's intact, it can be. Yeah, I agree. I, I think um, we've all changed, certainly where I work, we've all changed our diagnostic approach now. And we are proactively um, screening each case with, you know, just in the back of our mind, um, particularly when it's a young patient, are there any features here that I need to be alert to in terms of escalating this one. And we've just gotten the stains and we uh, managed to get both FH and 2SC, which is um, really exciting. I haven't had an, an opportunity to use them yet, but looking forward to it for the next tricky Lyme armor. Um, and the other question is, if you have a case that you want to call a stump and then it comes back with a lack of FH staining, would you be comfortable downgrading this to an FH deficient Lyme armor based on this paper? Or do you, do you still prefer to give it that title of stump? No, I think they, I think I would be comfortable with to downgrade the diagnosis 
uh, because yeah, where, when I think when there is the loss of a page is very specific. The literature supports this, and so I I think I will be comfortable to downgrade this and not to diagnose as stuff. Yep. Yep, I agree with that. In fact, I've done that in practice um, in the last 12 months. Fantastic. Well, we've gone over the hour just a little. Is there any other um, comment anyone wants to make, questions? I'll just check there's no, there's no further questions from the audience. Okay, well, with that, um, a big thank you to our three presenters. You all did an amazing job. Um, and thank you also for adjusting the timing um, in light of the public holiday tomorrow in Australia. Um, thank you to my co-moderators and panellists for being here and helping and for the amazing tech support. Um, it's been a glitchy session. We've had lots of tech issues, but um, we managed to get through it. So well done, everybody. And thank you to our audience. Um, and also, please remember to fill out the evaluation form on your way out. Um, we really do appreciate the feedback. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you in November. Thanks, everyone. Have a good, good Thank day. You. Bye, Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day.